play in the four seasons. Just the name of that group starts your memory working overtime, trying to catalog all of the great music that's been made by those gentlemen over the years. And tonight, in honor of their appearance in Philadelphia this weekend, FM 98 presents an exclusive Philly interview with the voice of the Four Seasons, Frankie Valley. Hi, I'm Chris Chandler, and it's my pleasure tonight to help retrace some of the history and music of the Four Seasons from their earliest hits right up to the present. You'll hear Frankie Valley tell most of the story, and you'll hear him, Tom DeVito, Joe Long, and Bob Gaudio sing many of their greatest hits and a couple of their biggest losers. So let's get started. In the late 50s, it seemed like everybody in the Philly, Jersey, New York area was trying to be a singer. Street corner groups sprang up all over the place, and young men spent hours of their free time copying the sounds of the Flamingos, the Crests, and many other groups that they heard on their radios. Frankie Valley and several of his buddies were a slight exception to the rule, however, because they got good enough to start singing in clubs as well as on street corners. At one such performance, they met another young singer from the Royal Teens, a group already well-known because of short shorts. This young man's name was Bob Gaudio. We met Bob. We, we saw that we had an awful lot in common. And about six months later, Bob joined us and became a, a part of uh, a group. We were, we were using the name The Four Lovers at that time. And he became a part of that. And uh, we went on to, uh, to do some recordings on our own. Well, we, we paid for them ourselves. And brought them to Bob Crew. And Bob Crew uh, uh, liked them. And uh, he gave us a record deal. Now, that we still weren't the Four Seasons yet. You're still the Four Lovers. Yeah, we were, besides being the Four Lovers, we were a number of other things. Like what? Uh, we were Billy Dixon and the Topics. We were the Village Voices. Uh, we were uh, turn of the century uh, piano uh, records. And, and we were Alex Aldo. And I mean, we could go on and on. Yeah? And it was very interesting. And, and for, uh, I, I'd say that... Uh, We've gotten most of our recording education by doing this. We were also the backup group uh, instrumentally and vocally for everything that Bob Crew was recording at that time. Oh, uh, Bob Crew, often called the fifth season. He was one of the early rock producers and writers who worked with the likes of Freddie Cannon, Danny and the Juniors, The Rays, and many, many others. He liked what he heard from the four lovers and put them to work backing up many of these groups throughout 1959 and the early 60s. Eventually, the guys got a little tired of being the bridesmaids and decided to get Bob Crew to make them brides. He said okay, they got together, and Bob Gaudio came up with their first smash. In the course of a week we had been rehearsing, Bob Gaudio came in on one of our final days of, of rehearsing and said, I wrote a smash, man. He says, you got to hear it. He said, and he played Sherry. Yeah. was 1962. They knew the song could be a big record, but first they had to find a record company that would release it. Well, Bob Crew went to work, and he made a deal with VJ Records. But before they could release it, the boys wanted to come up with a better name than the Four Lovers. Well, after we had recorded Sherry, uh, it was kind of throw names in a hat. And uh, we had come up with every name imaginable, the Losers and, and the... Uh, you name it, you know, we had a name. Uh, we figured every bird had been used, and uh, it was really... Uh, Most cars had been used right. at that point. So it, coming up with a name, I, I was trying to think of something that would be able to sustain a success, a name that, that uh, wouldn't wear out so fast that, that it, it, it would be obsolete. So uh, we happened to be working at a club called the Four Seasons Cocktail Lounge. And I, I looked at the name, you know, and I said, this would be a great name. Now they and the rest of the world knew who they were. And the hits just kept coming, mostly from the combined efforts of Bob Gaudio and Bob Crew, who wrote many of the songs together. Their first couple of songs at VJ Records were quite similar, at least in the total sound. Although the rhythm patterns of, of uh, the first three hits that we had were different, uh, there was a, a tremendous similarity between 
the, you know, it was, we were shooting for a sound more than anything else. Lyrics were not that important at that particular point. Uh, Sherry, uh, Big Girls Don't Cry, and Walk Like a Man were, they were similar in their own way, although they were not. Chord structures were totally different. But we, we shot for the same type of things where uh, uh, bass voice solos, After a couple of good-sized hits with VJ, some changes started to occur. Unhappy with the monetary deal with VJ, the boys went looking for a new company. They found one in Phillips Records and another series of hits followed. But there was a change in the music as well as the record company. The change came at dawn. You know, from, from dawn on. Uh, well, Candy Girl was also uh, done in that Sherry thing, but it, that was a slight change. I think Candy Girl initiated a change for dawn. Dawn was really an abrupt change and nobody expected it. The most obvious thing in, uh, in Dawn was, uh, I, I remember doing Dawn and I remember talking it over and, and what was going to be done. At that same time, uh, well, it was a record called Moore. And it so had... That's, that's the, thing, the thing from Mondo County. Right. All right. And, it, and it had a basic rhythm feel that I just loved. And when they were doing Dawn, uh, I gave my opinion of what I thought the rhythm should do. And the rhythm does exactly that. You know, it's a basic rolling type of rhythm. It's like a... And it just moves very nicely. The other changes in Dawn, it was the first time we'd, we'd used uh, more than one horn. And then we used an assortment of uh, percussion instruments, the chimes, chimes and bells, and orchestra bells, and it, it was, it was a whole fresh kind of thing. important word in the career of the Four Seasons, at least change in the kind of song and in the approach that they took. We went through uh, the Dawn and, uh, and uh, Ronnie and Save It For Me, which then again were all similar in their own way. And Ragdoll was a total departure. There was a rhythm feeling, but it was a ballad ballad in comparison to anything else that we had done. We had really stayed away from really doing out-and-out -out ballads. Don't ask me why, but this whole thing, uh, this excitement that had been created with the big sound and every record sounding like gangbusters right away had sort of kept us away from doing ballads. And when we, when we did Ragdoll, there was an awful lot of consideration on what was going to be done in front of it to still create or let people know that it was the sound. And, and there again, we relied uh, upon the, uh, uh, the, with the group doing the ooze and, and doing an obligato thing against it, using church kind of figures again, and giving it almost that haunting sound. Some people as the number one song of the year in 64. 
And Bye Bye Baby was number 12 in 65. Bye Bye Baby was was uh, one of the first, uh, you know, it was, it, we were constantly trying new things and trying, taking chances and doing things. Uh, through those years, most records were dance records. And Bye Bye Baby, the tempo stopped a couple times. And everybody was a little worried about putting that record out uh, because of, of all the different uh, changes and so forth and so on. And we put it out, and, and, it, and it, it worked out to be a success. And, and the lyric is uh, as simple as it was put. The lyric had an awful lot to say. If you hate me after Interestingly enough, a few months after he released the song, someone else did a version of it that became a smash. There were several times that uh, that we had really stepped ahead of uh, what was going on or what was to be accepted. Uh, the, uh, the Sun Ain't Gonna Shine uh, is a great example of that. Uh, I recorded The Sun Ain't Gonna Shine as a solo record, uh, oh, I guess at least six or eight months before the Walker Brothers did. Bob Gordio wrote it specifically for me. And uh, I, I had a regional hit in about five places with it, like uh, Philadelphia and Cincinnati and, uh, and Boston. The Providence. Really, and, and that was it. And the record just couldn't get off the ground. Eight months later, the Walker Brothers came along, caught the exact arrangement, did the exact type, same type of performance, and had a smash. Loneliness is the coat you wear. Deep shade of blue. word to the Four Seasons, but another word that became their trademark was sound. Most of their records carried that word right on the label, the sound of the Four Seasons. What were the ingredients of the sound, and how did it develop? Since we had been doing uh, record dates together, you know, for everybody else, uh, Gordio being a writer and being an inventive, creative individual, along with crew, I had realized that uh, I did have an exceptional range for a singer. So I, I have about a three and a half octave range. And they just felt that there wasn't a singer on the scene who was doing anything like that and taking advantage of the entire thing. So when they began to write, uh, they wrote with no limitation. They never really had to stop and think and say, well, this is cool, man, but this part of the song will be too low and or this will be too high because one way or another we could do it. There's the no harmony we here. used was a, was a basic harmony which has been used for hundreds of years. I mean, we use a basic church type harmony uh, because it's the fullest sound. It's, it's not modern. It's, it's, uh, it plays tricks on your ears. There are overtones that you think you're hearing other things that are not really there. And it's just, it's probably the soundest harmony there ever was and ever will be. Another uh, very important thing on most of our records was drums. We really did a number on featuring drums. Uh, uh, the rhythm patterns that drums do, I think, are very important on, on all records. We used an awful lot of percussion things. We used uh, jaw bones uh, and we, uh, uh, we used hair drums and timbales, and for a, a, a large part of my life, I, I played drums with for all the groups I worked with. So I, in my own way, was a frustrated drummer, and uh, 
I'd say, even though we had a drummer, I'd, I'd say, well, listen, how about if I play hair drum, you know? And I just wanted to be a part of it, I guess. If you hear Frank Sinatra on one record, you've heard him on everything, you know? Do you like the song he's doing? And that, it's that simple. I don't think that you should have to uh, make radical changes so that you don't sound like you, or you should all of a sudden want to be what everyone else is. The thing that we, we tried to, uh, to keep intact was our individuality. We were what we were. We did what we liked. And we had an audience that liked what we did. And so why would we have to change? Why would we have to get heavy? And why would we have to dress like we were fixing cars all day and get into that whole thing? It just wasn't us. from what was considered to be the hit music of the day and brought out an old Cole Porter tune in their own sound and style. And the man that most influenced their decision to record and release that record was Old Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra. We Miami Beach at another music operator's convention. And uh, Frank Sinatra was working at the, at the Fontainebleau. And we were invited to see the show at ringside and I got you under my skin was one of the songs that uh, he had scheduled on his show that he had done uh, that night the show was over and it was sensational and the whole thing and everybody retired and Bob Gordio called me about 4.30 in the morning he said I can't sleep he says I gotta smash he said while keeping the sound. It was different because if you heard Tell It To The Rain in its natural form as the way it was written, uh, a lot of the things we, we've done had, if you heard them in their raw form, had a country flavor. The ragdoll, which, you know, is, is really a, a dawn and very country oriented, even as far as the, the chord changes are concerned. Uh, Tell It To The Rain was uh, a slight departure from, uh, well, it was an immense departure from I've Got You Under My Skin, but we felt that it, it, we needed to do that. You know, we shouldn't just stay and now and do nothing but I've Got You Under My Skin. was a good year for the group for another reason. One of their members had a major hit as a solo artist, 
That was the year Frankie Valli finally got the recognition as a singer that he had deserved for so long. That was the year no one could take his eyes off Mr. Frankie Valli. Can't take my eyes off. He was recorded and in the can for six months. Couldn't decide whether they wanted to put it out or not. What, what, every day we would go over this whole thing, you know, about what, which record should come out. And uh, everybody would get touted off putting it out. And finally, we did put it out. And it was a hit. We felt that uh, it shouldn't be that. It should be a very intimate kind of effort. And, and it, it, putting four guys doing it, singing, can't take my eyes off you. That would be fine for some later to do something like that. But the intimacy that can't take my eyes off you had efforts uh, ever achieved by any songwriters is just a fantastic song. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off you. You'd be like heaven. Valley lost the mysterious golden touch. They tried to keep it going, but for some reason, they couldn't buy a hit. Frankie did some solo things, including You're Gonna Hurt Yourself, I Make a Fool of Myself, and To Give, but nothing seemed to work. In addition to their lack of success with record buyers, they also had some legal difficulties, which tied them up for enough months to make matters even worse. Finally, they did another album. It was the Four Seasons' response to the protest atmosphere of the late 60s, and it was called Genuine Imitation Life Gazette. If you have a copy of that album, consider yourself a record collector. It just didn't make it. Again, for no easily explainable reason. The sound was still there, the talent was still there, but very few people bought it. The lean years had begun for Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. The lean years brought about another change. This time, it was a change to a different record company. The Four Seasons moved to Mo West, the Motown label on the West Coast. Again, they tried an album, maintaining the sound and style of the Four Seasons. But again, the magic was gone. The album, Chameleon, was one of Frankie Valli's favorites. But unfortunately, the record-buying public didn't agree with his tastes. The album just didn't make it. There was one song on the LP, though, that expressed the philosophy of Frankie and the Season. And it was this song that helped him through the lean years. We do a thing in person that is in an album called A New Beginning. That I happen to think is, lyrically, is one of the heaviest lyrics I've ever heard in my life. Uh, the marriage between the lyrics of that song and the music are absolutely fantastic. And I, I you know, I do it in concert and I do it at an evening of gold where everybody's listening for the old songs and that whole thing and it's drop a pin time you know like it, it just has that kind of con uh well it relates to everyone's life it's anybody everybody at one time or another has gone through their life and reached a point where they said it's time for a new beginning you know and it, it's just a the, the lyric of the song goes, uh, a, a new beginning, second time around, another inning, starting today, leaving the gray, facing the light. The dark behind you had to shadow down for me to find you, lest you forget, never regret. Uh, today that world is over, we cannot live it over. You've hit the bottom side, you nearly died. A chosen few can get through tomorrow. Beg or borrow, you wrote the song, now you've got to sing along. It's what everybody does. We write our own song in life, and however it winds up, we do it. And there's no sense in going back. Fix what you have to fix, and look ahead, because the past is the past. The time goes by, and it'll be past. And all it will do is serve as a good reminder of what you should do. new beginning.
Valley and the Four Seasons have had a major hit, and yet they still pack them in for concerts. Is it just nostalgia? Or is it because despite having no new hit records, the Four Seasons are basically good entertainers who make audiences glad they came no matter what songs they sing? It looks right now as though Frankie Valley might be on his way to a new beginning with his new song on Playboy Records. Frankie Valley fans hope so. Sunday night, he and the Seasons will be at the Academy of Music for a one-night stand. Long-time fans will be able to relive some of the changes the seasons have made over the years. And just possibly, we could all be in on the new beginning for Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons.